Hey, welcome to the Dripping Stone Podcast, the podcast for two friends, raise a glass, and have a conversation. I'm Nick. I am Kyle. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing? I was, I was gonna outweigh you. I was gonna see how long it was gonna take. <laughs> what was it? Three seconds? Yeah. I couldn't take it. Couldn't I, take that silence. I, I, well, we were, <laughs> we were right in. We were looking into each other's eyes. <laughs> yeah, like, got who's, lost. Who's gonna be? <laughs> could have been eternity, could have been three seconds. Somewhere in the middle. Very good point. <laughs> Time is irrelevant. Uh, Kyle. Yes, sir. You want to drink something? I do. What you got? Man, I've, I've got a great bottle. I tease this. Why? Don't be rude. Don't be mean. No, it's like, you know, tantalizing. Oh. A little, you... little tease. Uh, I teased this several weeks ago on the Instagram. Oh. Because I found this bottle. Really wanted to get this bottle as soon as I saw it was released. Yeah. This is Chattanooga Whiskey Scotch Cask. Ooh, we love Not this just Chattanooga. Scotch Cask. It's Isla Scotch Cask. Interesting. Finish. Yeah. Barrel finishing series from the good old people at Chattanooga Whiskey. So this is a whiskey. This is a, it's a, it's a bourbon or it's a whiskey? It's a bourbon. Okay. So it's a bourbon that they've aged in former Scotch casks. Yeah. Straight bourbon whiskey finished in Isla Scotch Cask. Which is interesting because a lot of Isla Scotch casks are former bourbon <laughs> yeah, casks. Yeah. Ex-bourbon <laughs> right? casks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just going the other way with it. So do you, how much do you know about this? Um... How much do you want to know? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say like... <laughs> well, okay. Do I'm you not going to fall into that trope. I see where you're going. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> do, do you know if they put the bourbon in the barrels and aged it in Scotland, or did they put the bourbon in barrels and age it here? They aged it here. Oh, okay. They, okay. They purchased um, barrels from, I think, several different uh, distilleries gotcha. over in Scotland. Gotcha. And they're finished in Scotch casks, or they're actually aged in Scotch casks? finished okay okay we don't know how long that finishing process is uh well let me let me give you some words like Chattanooga, chattanooga whiskey is pretty great about including yeah a lot of info yeah right on the bottle yep right on the label what so, you got uh barrel finished tennessee high malt our limited edition finishing series celebrates the union of tennessee high malt into a variety of classic finishing casks Ooh. crafted from a combination of unique bourbon mash bills all containing at least 25% special, specialty malted grains. Each batch is custom made to complement the flavor and aroma characteristics of the finishing barrel. Interesting. We hope you enjoy it as much as we do. So it is a bourbon. Mm-hmm. It is at least 51% corn and then 25% malted grains. Yep. Interesting. Probably um, barley and, and maybe oats maybe. I don't know. Some of their uh, more finer details. Yeah. Mash bill <gasps> is B004. And SB091. Nailed it. Yep. (laughs) Cooperage, 53-gallon toasted and charred oak barrels. Okay. Filtration, non-chill. Finish, Isla Scotch barrels, three types. Okay. So I'm guessing like three different distilleries. Sure. Uh, Finishing time, greater than three months. Interesting. That's pretty cool. You know know what? I wish more people did that. For sure. Come on. Don't... (laughs) That's what frustrates me about so many distilleries is like... Okay, I know that all of this is proprietary information, but mm-hmm. come on. We know a, a distillery in this part of Kentucky and a s- distillery in this part of Florida, even if they do the exact same process, it's going to be different liquid. Right. So, like, a lot of it comes down to not the distillery as well. Right. You know, it's kind of left up to chance. Yeah. So, I love that they're putting all that on there. Same. Age, greater than four years. Batch size, five to seven barrels. So, the liquid is greater than four years. Yep. They then finish it more than three months in scotch casks. Yep. Okay. What is the ABV? ABV is coming in at a 47.5% alcohol by volume, 95 95 proof. All right. Nice. Yeah. And they're not the first one to do this by any means. No. That I I can think of anyway. No, but it's not a popular thing. No, it's really not. No. I mean, off the top of my head, I can't think of another bottle. The something that kind of comes close and it's not exactly this is uh, the High West Campfire. Right. And we did that on an episode, yep. but that is actually blending several whiskeys together. Right. Whereas this is a bourbon that's been aged in scotch casks. Right. Interesting. Yep. Okay. And I, I got to say, I think they might have the best named head distiller in the game. Grant McCracken. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Can you say that again? Grant yeah. McCracken. Grant McCracken. Yeah. You think that's his real name? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you know what they call me i'm not gonna ruin that dream <laughs> by asking we're just gonna leave it as it is would you like a pour uh no all right i'm gonna have one okay nice okay now that you've opened the bottle like sure give yeah, me one it's already in the air yeah 
Ooh. Thank you, sir. Got to say, I really enjoy a cork from a Chattanooga whiskey bottle. Why is that? That is because the the whole cap cork assembly is all just one thing. Yep. That's it's very true. One, one giant cork, and I like well, it. Well, then you, sir, will love the new Basil Hayden corks. Because <laughs> it's the same thing. Cool. <laughs> Can't wait to not try that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm not going to say that. Like, uh, I'm sure Basil, at some point in time, will get their act together, and they're going to do the same thing that uh, Benchmark just did. Well, okay. They're going to give you a foolproof. They're going to yeah. give you a top shelf. They're going to give you a bonded. They're going to give you a you actually, bottom you, shelf. You bring up a point that, that I kind of want to touch on, and we made this actually last week and on the cruise ship episode, too, where we talked about so many distilleries are doing exact things exactly like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's something that Scotch has been doing for years where they'll age in, you know, they'll take their regular you know, 10-year Scotch, and then they'll throw it in Madeira casks, or they'll throw it in Sherry casks for a little while. And this is nothing new in the Scotch world. And I, I wonder if it's because bourbon has been such a, a purist kind of thing that only now are they starting to do that. And I, I'm really interested because, you know, you want to diversify your product. You want to get more bottles in the hands of, of consumers. And you need to kind of throw all these things together to get people to buy it. Yep. You're starting to see that with Jack Daniels. You're you're going to see it in every whiskey producer for sure. Yeah, I would totally go do it. I'd, yeah. I'd fall right into that trap too. Ab- absolutely. Oh man, I've always said, what would Basil Hayden's taste like at a hundred proof? Right? right at one hundred and ten. Exactly. Know, like you, you you immediately like absolutely. I'm in. Yep. Here's my money. Yeah, for sure. All right. Anyway, got our Glen- Chattanooga whiskey. Got our Glen Cairns filled up. Yeah. Good pours. <laughs> it's, th- these are my standard pours now, Kyle. Yeah. yeah. On the nose. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's scotch. It's scotch. It, well, it, but it's bourbon too. Yeah. That's a, okay. I first get scotch. Yep. Just like peaty Isla scotch. Yep. But then like resting right beneath that is this really beautiful, just standard bourbon note. Yep. And, and like warm, round and friendly. Yep. What you thinking? I can see, I can see that motor running. Uh, I'm just, I mean, it's just different. Like it just has a different aroma. Like you recognize the bourbon, you recognize the peat, but it's just different. Yeah, this this leans a little more campfire to me. Mm-hmm. Um, less peat, more like charcoal campfire. I mean, peat is definitely there, but there's like again, just a a charcoal kind of campfire, almost like a charcoal briquette. That'd be, like, that'd be like one of those fun little like I've I've been seeing a lot of those like nosing kits. Yeah, like that'd be a fun one. It would be just smoke. Like, here's what mesquite smoke is. Oh, yeah. Here's what peat smoke is. Here's what charcoal smoke is. Like, here's oak. You know, like that kind of a thing. But, man, I just love this nose yeah. so much because, like, it, it gives me the whole spectrum it of really does. whiskey. You're right. It's like all of whiskey in a glass. Yeah, totally. I really like the proof that comes out on the nose, too. Like, it, it just yeah. it lingers there in the background. It kind of cuts through the, the, the campfire peatiness. It cuts through the sweet bourbon. But you take that deep nose and like, yeah, it'll start to kind of like give you that, that nose tickle, that little burn. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah. All right. Great nose. I'm going in. All right. Mm. Damn. Woo. I mean, just a flavor explosion. My goodness. Wow. You get this really powerful bitter that comes from, I'm assuming the peat of the, the casks. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's not peat initially. It's just like, just a bitter that just right through your burnt wood yeah like exactly that once you get that then you got this really nice like the bourbon kind of sweet wash and then on the back end you get peat again so it's like bitter friendly sweet bourbon and then here's your peat yeah and then it finishes with like pepper and honey yeah it's like pepper and honey yeah like a sweet yeah like a smoked pepper yeah that's exactly what it is it's like black pepper and honey and that's the finish I mean when you talk about the roller coaster, wow. when we talk wow. about the roller coaster, man, this is every bit of like the wildest ride that I think you can get out of a whiskey. <laughs> it really, truly there is. There are so many things happening. So much to look at. So many turns. You go upside down five times. Yeah. It's crazy. I can't even talk. That's how many times I've been upside down. <laughs> so good. And it's, it's one of those things of like, you would not expect that. Like, I'm, I'm thinking of all the things that I know about scotch, all the things I know about whiskey, and then... Okay, I'm interested. You got me. Right. I'm interested. I bought the bottle. Here we go. And then you try it and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? 
Like, where is this coming from? Right. Like, okay, you can absolutely pick out bourbon. You can absolutely pick out scotch. Mm-hmm. But then you get this, like, woody oaky note on the side. Right. And then you take another sip, and you're like, oh, straight honey. And then another sip, like, oh, like caramelized brown sugar. Like, oh, this is really interesting. Yeah, a little bit of citrus. Like, there's so many different things that pop through at different points. Yeah. I mean, I get I get all those things. But then I, I also, like, I'm really noticing, like, those sweet, like, sugar-covered orange chewy candies. Yeah. That are, like, just, like, really, like, tangerine, fake tangerine. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of that. Yep. And, like, I feel like it kicks way above a 95. Mm. I feel like there's enough of a bite, and I think that's just coming from, like, that spicy, peppery note. Yeah. That it feels like it's above 100. See, I, I would say, like, it feels lower than that, but I think it's because, A, I know, and B... It's that that peatiness I always attribute to pushing like it, for some reason in my mind, it pushes proof higher, mm-hmm. even though I know it's not. So when I get something that's peaty, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's definitely got some kick to it. And it normally doesn't. So I think like it's the bitter and the peat that pushes it up. Right. Because then when you do get something that has some proof to it, like a Lafroy cask strength, you're like, oh, holy crap. There it is. Right. Man, that's delightful. Ever since I've opened this bottle. It's like my favorite pour right now. How have you not For gone sure. through that whole bottle? Because I don't want to finish it. <laughs> I keep going back to the store to buy more, and they've got them. But I keep going back and finding other things. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. But I want you to. But I don't want to try that. I've never had that. So I end up getting something else. But I've like convinced myself, all right, you got to go back and buy a few more. Yeah. I am surprised in how much I like this, but I'm not surprised in that when you think about the whiskey journey, you think about like all of the things that we've done. Sure. This makes total sense. Yeah, totally. But it's giving you, I'm surprised it's that good. It's giving you some of everything. (laughs) Yeah. Cause it, cause it could, I mean, you could get something like this and it just be, woo. Yeah. Like that's just all over the board. Like that's just everywhere and it'd be unsettling. Yeah. But this works so well. Like I remember after we had the campfire, like I was doing like, you know, some, Amalgamy. Alchemy. Alchemy. Sorry. <laughs> Amalgamation. I was doing alchemy of mixing bourbons and scotches together, trying to find like a happy place. And like right. definitely found some success with it, but also like tried some things that were just like, ooh, that Oof. is no good. Yeah. So for, for them to do it and it worked and it came out this beautiful is really nice. Well, and I think, and maybe Chattanooga, because I know the fans of the podcast, um, Grant, write in and let us know. But I wonder if. There's more blending to this than you would for a normal bourbon. And what I mean by that is they say the age is greater than four years. Okay. So then are they taking this particular whiskey? It's aged for four and a half years. They now put it into a scotch cask from Brooklotic for, you know, three and a half months. And then they're going to blend it with a whiskey that's five and a half years old. That's been aged in a cask from Lafroy for 11 months. And is that how they're doing this? And I know that's, that's a that's lot a of lot. computational math that we're not going to do, <laughs> but like that, that's what the scotch makers do. Like it's all about blending for them. Right. And I mean, sure you can get unblended and single malts and, and things like that. But like when you think about the blending of scotch, I mean, that is an art form in and of itself. So I wonder if there's some of that going on here too, where nope, this is, we've blended all these things together and this is the correct blend. For whatever reason, I'm about halfway through the pour Yep. and I'm going back in for the nose and it's straight vanilla sugar cookie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm in the mall, and I'm walking past the cookie store, and it's just that straight vanilla sugar cookie. Yeah. That's bananas. Or like... I mean, I'm not saying bananas. <laughs> I'm saying, like, that's crazy, because, like, I don't get any peat anymore. It's just it's just straight vanilla sugar cookie. It smells so to crazy. me like every generic grocery store, you know, box of cookies that, like, the grocery store has made, the bakery and right. the grocery store has made. Right. Like, that's exactly what it smells like. Like, that, like... Like, why is that frosting that color? But it's going to be delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's going to go down real quick. <laughs> I've eaten six of them. And then I took a breath. I was like, oh, God. Ate six. I saw a great TikTok the other day a guy made where it's like he slams down a package of Oreos and opens it and eats one. The He kind of like blinks and looks down. And like there's like a dozen gone. <laughs> and it cuts back to him. And he's got like cookie dust all over his face. <laughs> and then he like... And, it, and he looks down again and he's all shocked and they're all gone and it cuts back to him and he's like sweating with like Oreo dust all over his face. Yeah. He's like, every time, every time I open a package of Oreos. 
<laughs> you can't eat just one. <laughs> I defy you to yeah. eat just one. I could I could eat one Lay's potato chip far easier than I could eat one Oreo. <laughs> All right, now Kyle, that we have a great drink. Yep. What do you want to talk about this week? A fun topic I thought would be interesting to kind of hash out. Mm-hmm. What do you What do you know about the the Dunning Kruger effect? Dunning Kruger effect. Yep. Um, you know where it came from? It's Star Trek, probably. It sounds like a Star Trek thing. Like, you know, get the Dunning Kruger. And let's see how it affects data. Data? Next generation. Yeah. Where are you going? You going OG? Kurt? I don't know. Spock? Who? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be like the best. Like making all these like references that like, and then like they, they go back to you and you're like, huh? <laughs> Is your reference, man? What? <laughs> Who's Kirk? Never mind. Kurt? Got it. <laughs> Dunning Kruger. Yeah. So it started. The whole concept um, evolves around this like really weird case of a guy that tried to rob a bank because he took lemon juice <laughs> and spread it all over his face because he watched a video or something or read a book about how invisible ink is made. Uh huh. And they use lemon juice to make invisible ink. Uh huh. And so he used the lemon juice to make himself invisible. And like uh-huh. went to the bank to rob the bank and like looked at the cameras and everything and like gave a very clear view of himself because he thought that he understood how invisible ink was made and he understood the concept well enough to apply it to himself. I feel like you're making this up. No, this is legit. Like, like, <laughs> okay. I mean, all the videos that I watched on it anyway, they all mention this of like this is like the the, the basis of that. And so like the people that studied the case are both of them were yeah. Dunning and Kruger. Yeah. And they were the people that like researched this like concept. Yeah. These two like, psychologists. Right. Yeah, yeah. Of like trying to understand like this basis of having a, you know, kind of a generalized understanding of a thing and feeling like you have a great grasp of the entirety of the concept. Right. Do you know what state that occurred in this bank robbery? I, I gotta know. Like, <laughs> Florida. You know it happened well, in Florida. That's what I'm trying to like. I've got three states in mind. I'm going to say those three states, and then you're going to tell me the right one. Okay. You got it? Mm-hmm. Okay. The lemon juice robbery mm-hmm. happened in one of these three states. Florida, mm-hmm. Maryland, mm-hmm. Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Happened in? Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, it's basically Maryland. 1995. Oh, what? Not that long ago. <laughs> Not that long ago. So... Dude had the internet, but had like AOL internet. I mean, probably had access to YouTube. Sure. I mean, it started in, it might have started in 95. No, it didn't. No? No, YouTube was like 2007. Okay. <laughs> Still, had the internet. Okay, so it starts with this robbery, mm-hmm. but what what did they ultimately come up with? Like, what is the Dunning-Kruger effect? According to Wikipedia, which completely accepted in all forms of higher education <laughs> um, statistical data. Correct. Uh, a cognitive bias whereby people with low ability, expertise, or experience regarding a certain type of a task or area of knowledge tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. <laughs> okay, so it's all about so it's overestimation. A, a huge overestimation of understanding of a topic. I feel like you just read the description of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you- <laughs> you're not wrong. And like, if you if you look at the scale of the Dunning-Kruger effect, like, I mean, that's... Absolutely. And and anybody that's gone through, I would say, kind of like any real class where they tried to learn a thing. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Can you, can you describe that uh, line graph for a second? Sure. So, I mean, it, it, you know, you're, it's just a basic line chart. Uh-huh. And as it starts, you're at the very bottom. Yep. It vastly peaks really quickly, like, like rapidly in, inclines in, to a peak. In terms of knowledge acquisition? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, confidence. Oh, okay. Confidence so and understanding. X, X and thing. Y axis is what? Uh, so the one that I'm looking at currently, the X axis is competence. The okay. Y axis is confidence. Competence and confidence. Okay. Yeah. So, so confidence peaks immediately. Right. Whereas competence is just getting started. Gotcha. So you're just barely going across the X, but Y is sky high. Right. And then, I am super confident that I know everything about this thing. I just started learning it last Wednesday. Correct. Got it. But then the 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 downside immediately happens. It tanks into what is called the valley of despair. <laughs> because now you're like you're, you're beyond that and you're like, "Oh shit, I really don't know anything about this thing." If you get to that point. And then there is a slow slope of enlightenment. Ooh. That you finally reach the plateau of sustainability. <laughs> 
I but like that. The name of the peak yeah. is the peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like that first peak. Yeah, that first right, peak yeah. is the peak of Mount Stupid. Okay, so within this, you know, I'm thinking about this this idea of the Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah, and you just described this line graph that I, I like that, mm-hmm. but I don't think people actually get to that valley of despair. So often, too often, people never get that far. Right. Exhibit A. I already made it. The internet. Right. You see so many people posting so many things about like I'm an expert in this thing or I know all of this stuff, but then. You scratch beneath the surface, and there's not much there, but still, they know it all. Right. Well, and, you know, I think I think that's kind of like just an age that we live in, too, of the mm-hmm. fake it till you make it, you know, world that we live in. Right. Of, like, no, nah, I've got to die on this hill because I've, I've made the post already kind of a thing, and not the realization of, you know what, maybe I could provide a, a little bit more of a nuanced take on this right that's not possible i nailed it the first time <laughs> I, I learned nothing i've learned nothing i learned nothing i was the expert as soon as i started reading things sure when you think about the individual mm-hmm. there are and i hate to be semi-binary in this but there are three types of individuals that the dunning kruger effect is really remarking upon i think so too there is the initiant i guess you could say sure the person who like finds out something interesting and tries to learn as much as they can now i know all the things right there's the the moderately informed Mm -hmm. that middle version these are people who have already gone through that process who have actually learned enough to know that they don't know anything right and then there's the quote-unquote expert sure and I think those three individuals, somewhere along that line chart or somewhere within this Dunning-Kruger effect, we, we've all known people within that. Well, I look at it, and, and even within myself, I recognize places in my life where it absolutely took place for me. What do you mean? I, I would say easily. I think I could look at my college experience <laughs> as the Dunning-Kruger effect right. of freshman year, I've got this, man. I just graduated from high school. I know a lot. I'm really good at this thing that I'm going into to study. All my life, people have been telling me how good you are right. at this. All right, well, I'm going to college now. So, like, y'all really ain't got nothing to teach me. I just need you can go and give me the degree now if you'd like. Right. And, you know, we can save everybody a lot of time here. Um, and then, you know, not very long into freshman year, you're like, oh. <laughs> and then you quickly fall down into that valley of despair of like, man. I really don't know anything about this. (laughs) And there are people who know far more than me and are far more gifted at this thing or talented or what have you. And that slow climb up that, you know, can take a lifetime. Yeah. I I agree. I agree completely. I mean, how many times have I like become interested in something and like consumed as much information about that thing as I could. So now I feel like, wow, you have a lot of information here. You know, a lot of things you've done a lot of, you know, deep dives on YouTube. You've read a whole bunch of different uh, articles. You've read some books about it. So you know, a lot of things about it. And I think for me, what kind of becomes the limiting factor in a way is that I have enough knowledge to have a conversation Right. But not enough knowledge to have, you know, a really like nuanced conversation about that thing. Right. And for me, and, and I'm saying like new things that I learn. Right. You know, like I don't feel like I'm an expert in anything, one particular thing uh, explicitly maybe. But often I'll get to a point where like I hit that, uh, what do they call it? The peak of stupidity? Yes. And peak then, of Mount Stupid. <laughs> the peak of Mount Stupid. And then I realize... Actually, you need to do, if you are actually interested in this thing, you need to do a lot more learning, if you will. Right. And for me, that learning doesn't necessarily come in the form of reading and watching things. It now becomes in the form of asking questions. Sure. Of people that I think know more than I do. Yeah. And I wonder if that's where the application of this Dunning-Kruger effect becomes well, or and, takes place. And like to piggyback on that, I would add on to, I think so much of it is in, in learning in that way is experiential. Right. Like it's something that you have to go through and work through yourself. Somebody can tell you all day long, this is it, this is how it goes, this is the, the answer to that problem. But until you actually like are faced with it and work through it yourself, you don't really know it yeah that's a really good point because i think about all of my college professors and 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 teachers in general 
And as an educator, I can tell you this information. My role as an educator or a professor's role as a, uh, an educator of college students, I can tell you all this information and you implicitly believe that information because of my role, because of what right. societally we've agreed upon, this is that role. Right. However, you don't actually know if this information is correct or not. Right. So what happens is you, like you just said, have to experience that information. Right. You have to confront whether or not you are correct. Yeah. And I, I love that because that creates two elements. Mm-hmm. That creates the existential like, oh God, I actually know nothing about this thing. Right. Everything I thought was correct is not correct and I need to do some recal- recalibration here. Or it creates the everything I've learned is absolutely the truth. Right. And I'm not interested in having that thing challenged because I know all the stuff already. Right. I think that's, yeah, and that, and that kind of goes back to like your your point earlier of like a lot of people never reach that pit of despair. Right. They just, you know, I'm, I'm confident in what I understand and I'm not willing to question it or vary from that in any way. So you just, you just ride that out. <laughs> right. And I get it. Like as much as I don't want to admit that I get it, I get it because it's kind of in. Well, it's comfortable. I was going to say, it's an easier place you to know, be. There's a reason why it's called the Valley of Despair. <laughs> right. It sucks down there. Yeah, but there's also a reason why it's called Peak of Mount Stupid. Peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> but also like, you know, the, the the climbing up out of that though. Right. That's Nirvana. You know, like that, that's really. The like, band? Um, no. Oh, okay. No, like, like the. Buddhist idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <right>. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> the Buddhist idea of, uh, of Smells Like Teen Spirit. Got Concept. It. It's a concept. Oh, you know. okay. Um, <laughs> that's like the overwhelming, like feeling of relief, right? Of like, or honestly, too, it's like it's not even relief. It's you say like, that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'd say it's like it's also like as you, as you climb up out of that, as as you're gaining more knowledge, as you're gaining more information, it's an amazing feeling at the same time. Yeah. See, oh, I I, I think I disagree because for me, and this is me personally, that is where imposter syndrome sets in is that climbing out of that valley of despair. That idea of, I am not the thing that I want to be. I am not, I'm not the expert. I'm also not the idiot, but I'm not the expert. Here's a scenario. A friend of yours has just recently take a, taken up playing guitar, singer-songwriting, and is going to coffee shops and playing their songs. Mm-hmm. And they're terrible. Okay. They're terrible singers. But they think they're great. Terrible guitar player, but they think they're great. Okay. And then at some point, they realize I actually really suck at this. They then have to make a decision. Do I know that I suck at this and try to get better? Or do I know that I suck at this and I give it up? Mm-hmm. Like for that person who is able to understand, they, they reach the peak of Mount Stupid and they're like, actually, no, I do suck. So then that person makes a decision to start being better. Mm-hmm. They will experience, as I have in many instances, that idea of, wow, I do know more things, but I'm not there yet but I also am so afraid of being that person who's just wailing on stage with you know a crappy guitar and a terrible microphone and a raspy voice that I actually can't do anything because I'm not the person that I want to be. And it's almost that imposter syndrome of I can't recognize within that place that I actually know more or I actually am better. And I think that that insidious mediocre, that insidious like middle ground, you said pit of despair, that's reason why it's the pit of despair. Because you, you're starting to realize that. I guess. I mean, I, I definitely get what you're saying. I get your point. But I think what I'm saying is that coming out of the pit, yep. at that point, surely to goodness, you've accepted some humility. Uh, that's a good point. So coming up out of that, you're never going to go back to the peak right away. Right. You know, you're going to understand, no, I, I'm, I know I'm not that, but I'm humble enough to know where I was. Correct. And climbing out of that and being willing to... Uh, notice your own improvements yep. are amazing and very, for me anyway, w- w- is, is very enjoyable. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's that recognition of humility. Yeah. It's like, you know that, whoa. Because usually, or at least in my instance, I'll never make that mistake again <laughs> right. of thinking that I'm right. great. That only happened that one time. <laughs> and when I realized I wasn't and went down to the pit... Okay, cool. I will never make that mistake again. <laughs> right. Like I will accept well, humility now and be 
very humble. See, and I think moving that's, forward. that's what I'm talking about, the imposter syndrome, which I want to do a whole episode on in the future. But that imposter syndrome comes from that, is that I never want to do that thing again. So am I doing the right thing? I Am I writing the right way? Am I talking about this thing the right way? Am I creating the song in the right way? Or am I just an imposter? Yeah. Am I like doing it because that performative aspect and I actually don't know as much as I think I do. Well, I mean, you know, I like I, I look at it too like I, I can I can see this play out exactly in my whiskey journey. Oh hundred percent. As soon as I got into whiskey, found a couple of things that I liked and like just by like, you know, looking at the internet and things like that, I thought I understood, <laughs> oh yeah, no, these are the best bottles. These are fantastic whiskeys. Um and then quickly understanding, whoa I don't know anything about this stuff. Yep. And then like that slow journey up, like I would, I would never assume to say now, like, I mean, I love this bottle. Yep. This bottle is fantastic. And I understand with all the knowledge that I've gained in however many years that we've been having whiskey that I really enjoy that. The Chattanooga uh, Scotch cask. Yeah. But I would not at all say like, yep, this is my favorite bottle now. And it'll always be my favorite bottle. Cause this is amazing. Right. Cause I know how much my stuff's changed in the past year. Sure. So there's no, you know, there's no telling where I'll be at a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. I may yeah. not even want whiskey. Anymore. Well, in that same vein, we know, and we have a lot of listeners and, and sorry, but that are in that understanding of this bottle is the best bottle. It will always be the best bottle. I was told this is the best bottle and now I've made myself believe it's the best bottle. And that's all I care about. Right. Society has told me. Correct. And it's that confirmation bias on that side, too, of, nope, this is indeed the best bottle. Right. And that's why, like, I feel you and I, in terms of podcasts, have done a pretty decent job of, like, avoiding superlatives in the way of, like, this is the definitive whiskey. Right. Now, outside of the podcast, if people ask us, like, what is the best whiskey, I always preface it with, right now, I am currently enjoying, or my favorite whiskey right now is blank. Right. Because I also know tomorrow it's going to be different. Yeah, It's going to change tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I always have a hard time answering that question also of... You know, well, I can, I can tell you some really good ones. I don't know if I can tell you what, what my best right. is or what my favorite is, but I really like this right now. Yeah, well, my my kind of like in that modality, my go-to is to ask a question. And that is like, what is your current favorite whiskey? Well, it's this. Okay, so in this price range, which you've said bottle A, in that price range, I like bottle C. Right. And here's that bottle. And that's what I like in this price range. Right. But to say bottle A is better than this thing over here that's uh, 150 bucks, no, it, that that's not the same thing. Right. So like you can, I started to kind of ask questions, which is or how I think the individuals within this Dunning Kruger effect, your your novice peak amount stupid, your you know moderate intermediary person who's trying to figure things out, and your expert, I think that's how they should interact. It should be a line of inquiry and a line of questioning between those three people. Right. I don't think that's how that actually works. Oh, yeah, no. No, I mean, <laughs> for me, when it, whenever I, like, recognize that I'm in a situation with somebody that thinks they know a <laughs> lot about a thing, but it's kind of relevant that they don't. Like, there, there's... Nothing else I want to do more than to get out of that situation. <laughs> there, there, there is no conversation about to be had. Yeah. I avoid that completely. Yep. There's a, I, I don't know from where the proverb originates, but there's a proverb that says those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know. Right. And I think that that describes it perfectly. Yeah. Your initiant is someone who wants to talk about that thing incessantly. Right. Because they have the most confidence. <laughs> correct. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You're, you know, you're... They haven't been into the pit yet. Correct. And I think that that's the hesitancy of people not wanting to engage is like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to go back into that pit. Right. So I don't want to make the mistake again of speaking up and like being wrong. Exactly. I just want to hang tight where I'm at. And you're kind of, your inner intermediary person is always at like constantly checking themselves. And I think like I exist in that realm a lot. Oh, yeah. Like, for sure. Constantly considering, like, checking myself, is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? And I feel like an expert is also very similar in that the expert knows a lot, but almost refuses to divulge that knowledge as much, as readily as they could. Right. That, to me, is one of the the downfalls of when you really start to parse out the Dunning-Kruger effect is how the experts deal with the initiate. 
Correct. In that, like you said, if you are a quote unquote expert in a thing, rarely are you going to entertain the initiate. Right. I, I think like an example of that might be Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm-hmm. However you feel about the dude, I think people like that, people who are communicators of information um, in that way, like the dude knows the things. He's not like he's an expert in a lot of things or he's an expert in that thing. He doesn't know absolutely everything, but he knows people who do. So someone like that is willing to look at an initiate and say, like, I love your enthusiasm for this thing. However, here's where your understanding actually stops. Let me now provide you with more understanding. Right. Where a lot of experts don't do that. It's like this kind of elite club that your initiate almost has no no possibility of joining unless they figure out their own pit of despair on themselves, by themselves. Right. Well, and I think a lot of times the the expert's not available within, oh, a, within a conversation. Correct. So the moderate is is not going to be quick to argue or, you know, combat the person on Mount Stupid <laughs> because you don't want to get in that argument because you know that you don't understand the topic. Right. As well and as you don't you want should, to climb back to the top of not as stupid. well as you should, but as well as, as you know, is capable. Right. And, you know, the person that is highly confident that doesn't have as much knowledge, you know, there's, there's nothing that's going to, that you're right. going to be able to say really that's going to slow them down. Right. Well, it goes back to the adage of like, you can't argue with stupid. You're right. <laughs> right. You can't yeah. because yeah, that person pretty... is overconfident. Right. Absolutely. But, and I, I go back to like the, the whiskey scenario for earlier. Here's how someone who is that intermediary, here's how I deal with that. It's asking questions. It's asking questions of people I believe, and whether that's an internal belief or that or a perceptive belief or an actual belief in terms of like, no, you are an expert. You have done all the work. You are an expert, or right. I just think you are. I will ask questions, and to me, that allows me to parse out whether you are on the peak of Mount Stupid or you are an expert. Because I, I feel like personally, I'm a a good enough judge of information and knowledge that I can quickly. You know, you're on the peak amount stupid. Right. And I understand that. And I can't convince you otherwise. So I'm just going to ask questions. Sure. Which then gives me more knowledge. It's like that, you know, you're constantly kind of moving in that line graph, if you will. Right. I like that. Thank you. I came up with that on my own. Yeah. I, I realize that what I what I do <laughs> is is generally, um, I got this from Tom Segura. Mm. <laughs> he he said it in a in a special comedian for anybody that doesn't know. Yeah. Um, and when he said it, I was like, holy crap, that's exactly what I do <laughs> is if, if it gets into a situation that, you know, basically like it's just a conversation, doesn't really matter either way. Um, I'll immediately just take your side right. just to get out of it, just to get out of the argument. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> of, of, you know, I might've said the complete opposite and now you're combative. Okay. Well now I'm totally on your side. I, I just agree with what you're saying. <laughs> right. So we don't have to, we don't have to keep talking about this. Right. <laughs> we can just stop here. Yep. No. <laughs> Thomas Kincaid is the best artist ever. You're right. You're right. I totally agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Thor Dark World is indeed the best Marvel movie. You I are am, correct. I am on board. You are correct. Yep. You've shown me the light. I'm with you. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Show me the light. Thomas Kincaid. Like, that, was, that, that was a nice tie back together. <laughs> That's Freudian. <laughs> it was. It wasn't. You shouldn't say that because I I, I want to. No, it totally was. I want to bask in your. Uh, That's your, my understanding. That's my full understanding of, of Thomas Kincaid coming forward. <laughs> I knew him that well that I was able to make that reference and not even think about it. Everybody else is like, the fuck do you say? I don't get it. It's Kincaid. <laughs> Whatever. That's not giving our listeners enough credit, Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Those people, they're, they're so good. They, they know all that. Now nah, you like what you like. <laughs> no, no. I meant like they knew your reference. They oh, understood. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. Yeah. But now that we talk yeah, about sure, it, it's not funny I'm anymore. I'm sure Kincaid is like hugely popular like everywhere in the world. Except in Antarctica. Whenever I find myself in a situation where there is somebody talking mm-hmm. and I do have a grasp on the information about this topic. You are at a, a more expert level. Well, I'm just, I'm somewhere on the slope. Okay. You know, of enlightenment. And I can tell that you're sitting high on that peak. There is not a more frustrating scenario to be in for me. I agree. Like my blood absolutely boils. Yep. But I'm able to like, you know, again, just not get involved. I'm so happy that I am that way because I know a lot of people probably aren't. They absolutely have to combat yep. right away and, mm-hmm. and get involved and stri- you know set the record straight kind of a thing. But I can absolutely just ignore it and just be like, yep, you just keep talking. You know, for me, it's so difficult 
in terms of like matters of, I don't want to say like what I consider to be matters of belief, but I'm thinking like politics and we don't get into politics very often, but like when you know that an idea that someone is saying is inherently false. And I'm not talking about just like politically false or belief false, but like is like justifiably false. Right. And yet that falsity is so tied to their political or religious or whatever belief at that point, that's when I disengage completely. But on matters of like things that I am, am well versed in, I will then start to ask questions. And like I said, that is that is always my default. Even in some of those cases, I will ask questions. And I, I want to see how far, in some cases, that person will work themselves out of their own answer. Right. You know, what about this? Or can you explain that to me? And and doing so in a way that's not demeaning, is not pandering to them, but is trying to further the conversation without actually me putting in anything into the conversation other than questions because that does several things. It gets that the person wants to talk. That's what they want to do. They want to talk. So it enables me to engage in quote unquote conversation without actually saying my own opinions and offending that person because that's not my point necessarily. Sometimes it is, but it also allows them to keep talking and eventually they may work themselves into a, a Hmm. wait. Right. Right. And, Will I point that out to you? I might. It just depends on that situation. Might just punch a car. I, I might just punch One a car. One or the other. But to me, like you, you're 100 percent right. Like there's nothing more frustrating. I think for me, I've just learned to deal with that frustration. In I'm out, or I'll just ask questions, right? And just as many questions as I can come up with, because I'm good at that, and I'm good at asking questions. So we'll see where that gets me and gets you. I'm I'm good at being quiet, so I'll just sit back. <laughs> Let you roll. <laughs> That's exactly who we are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've had, I've had situations where like people tricked me more or less like by, you know, having me start the conversation by asking me the question, like, what do you think about this? Nah. And answering it honestly and just what I thought. And then them be, becoming very combative. Yeah. No. And then I'm just like, I'm not interested. Oh in no. Yeah. No, you're right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally see what you're saying now. So yeah. Yeah. My, what I said earlier, forget it. No, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. It does play into like education. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's what all education is. For sure. Of, you know, hitting that level of confidence that you feel like you know it and then being dropped down to rock bottom and digging your way out. Well, And I think that that's what good education does as a whole. It's, you know, one plus one is two. <gasps> I understand addition. Oh, yeah. I got this. I you, got this. Y- you're right. You do. Can you do it? backwards well then it's can you do 20 plus two right you can cool can you do 22 plus 22 now you got bigger numbers and it's it's that constantly building upon itself until you get to a point where failure right and it's that failure is when we grow and i think that's the most important part of this dunning kruger effect is realizing when actual growth occurs is when you've met the pinnacle of your understanding and something has happened that has caused you to fail and now you have to build it back up. Right. And having the curiosity, the drive to want to get out of it. Correct. Because I think there's also the the horrible situation of you hit that pit and then you're just like, well, I'm done with it. Yep. I'll never touch this again. Right. And that's that's kind of a shame too. Sure. I mean, we all do that in different modalities and, and in different situations, absolutely. But... I think that's part of also being a, a thinking individual is figuring out, do I want to take this further? Right. I've come to the edge of that knowledge. Do I want to continue? Well, not even that. It's like I, I've come to the edge or I've, I've come to the realization that I don't know anything about this and I'm not sure it's worth the effort. Correct. That is kind of the beauty of being human. Right. It's like you can I, make that I can make that choice. Yep. And that's also the downfall of being human is, yeah, I can make that choice. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. Sure. Well, you got anything else? No. Good conversation. No, really good conversation. Well, we'd love to know what you think about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now that you maybe know a little bit more about it, um, granted, we're not experts by any means. No, we would never. <laughs> no. We would never take maybe, that. Maybe you are a Dunning-Kruger stand. effect expert. And you want to <laughs> share you some... are Dunning or Kruger. Uh, correct. <laughs> and you want to share some uh, knowledge with us. We're absolutely for it. And if you've had the pleasure the privilege <laughs> of being able to sample the Chattanooga whiskey, Isla Scotch cask finish. It's amazing. It really so is. So don't tell me otherwise. 
Don't put me in that pit of despair. <laughs> but no, if you've had a chance of it, what did you think of it? Are you as high on it as we are? And if your name is Grant McCracken and you are the head distiller at Chattanooga Whiskey. Good uh, on you, man. Yeah. And, like, uh, high five your mom for me. Because <laughs> that's a great name. <laughs> Or your dad. Or your dad. Whoever came up with that. High five everybody. Yeah. Why not? High five to the folks. Yeah. Well, you can get in touch with us through email. It's drippingstone at gmail.com. You also get in touch with us through social media. It's always one word, drippingstone. D-R-E-P and stone. You can find us on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, pretty much anywhere. Find a thing, like a thing, share a thing. We would really appreciate that. Absolutely. And honestly, Kyle, we'd appreciate it if you support the podcast. Not only through your listens, which is awesome. Yeah. You could support the podcast financially. That's through our Buy Me A Coffee page. It's buymeacoffee.com slash drippingstone. Buy us a couple pints. Keep the fan working. The recording machine powered on. Yeah, we're hitting summer, guys. Like, we got to have that fan running constantly. Yeah, I mean, honestly. You take a break, we're a puddle. (laughs) Real quick. What Talk about cold, the pit of what, despair. What do cold things do in summer? They melt. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't want to melt. No, nah, I'm not a fan. Me neither. Doesn't take long. <laughs> I'm already, I'm already sweating. I got sweat. <laughs> I, I started sweating last time. I started sweating. Yeah, yeah. I haven't stopped sweating. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Whenever I use my brain, I sweat. And that's like constantly. <laughs> I'm, I'm breathing, I'm sweating. You can support the podcast by rating Drip and Stone wherever it is you find great podcasts like this one. And you can support the podcast by telling someone about Drip and Stone. Just, hey, have you heard about Drip and Stone? No? Now you have. <laughs> and uh, you should go listen to it right now. In fact, give me your phone. I'm going to show you how to download Drip and Stone. It's this easy. You can go to this place, this place, this place, this place, or this place. And now you have access to Drip and Stone because they're everywhere. Kaboom. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. May your glass overflow and your ass never show. Chattanooga cheers, buddy. (laughs) Choo-choo. A podcast has been uploaded. Yep. And you're listening to it. Boom. Feels more professional. You ever had a waffle butt? No. Tennis racket, hairbrush, on your ass. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I've never had one. i just been told that's a waffle butt. Is this an Alabama thing? Sure. <laughs> Gotta be. <laughs> okay. No other way. <laughs> Bro, that's like on you, man. four ounces. <laughs> like... Well, yeah, I mean, it's, three it's like, seasons. It's a, lot, it's a lot like Say by the Bell. Right. You know, like they try to nah. do the college years. Psh, no, you're done. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I watched the video. We don't, we don't usually play dumb like that. I just, I, the videos I watch. Shit, dude. You, you got me wrapped around your finger right now. I'm going to believe everything you say. <laughs> Spot on. I think and, it was. And probably like a Webster's dictionary version of it. I believe it. We are. We are what? At sea level. Yeah, we're also on the top of the earth. No. Are we at the peak of stupidity? We might be at the peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, think so. No, I don't think so either. No. Which, I mean, which you know, means we probably are. We're digging our way out. <laughs>